people are a bit uncertain about their financials currently now, about what's happening in the region and so on. So definitely it becomes an essential element of what should I buy as an essential versus the things that I want to buy. At least the revolution or evolution has been the rise of uh, the grocery delivery app. Um, overall, we've seen, you know, some of the key players, they've reported 200% increase in terms of traffic. And the industry overall has leapfrogged in the last two months. Things that we were anticipating that would happen over the next four years were already there. Welcome to uh, to Campaign's first webinar. It's really, really good to see so much interest. It's a virtual cousin of our popular breakfast briefings. And as with virtually all of our breakfast briefings, it's generously supported by um, a couple of Shwari group entities. Uh, these include the um, Brand Formance, the revolutionary TV attribution solution that measures the impact of TV ads on brands e-commerce, so particularly apt to today's discussion, um, and DMS itself, which is the region's leading digital partners for independent publishers and the official digital arm of the Schwerly Group. So thanks a lot for that, guys. It's great to have so much support from the community. Keep, keep visiting our website. We're updating it with new topic, new stories every day. Uh, we're posting as many stories as possible on our social channels, so do follow us there as well. Um, it's great to have so much support. We're still printing as well. Uh, so when you uh, get back to your office, you will find copies of the magazine on your desks. Um, if that's too long for you to wait, then there are links to the issue, that's I-S-S-U-U, uh, version of our magazine on our website. It's a really great way to get an almost print PDF version of the magazine without uh, getting your hands dirty. This webinar is on e-commerce, which seems to be one of the hottest topics around right now. Uh, it's important for more reasons than we have time to list, but here's some starters. Uh, during lockdown, consumers have been using e-commerce sites more and spending more on all sorts of things. For many retailers, e-commerce has been virtually their only source of income, their savior in some cases, the thing that's keeping them, them alive. And everyone with goods or services to sell is learning a lot about e-commerce very, very fast. See my comments about issue and everything. We're all becoming e-commerce experts, whether we started out that way or not. Media marketing and advertising, of course, is central to all aspects of e-commerce. And um, so today we're going to be looking at e-commerce through that media marketing and advertising lens to help the whole industry get better at it. I'm now going to do my big reveal. Um, here we have our panel. Um, I'm joined today by a fantastic panel of three of the most knowledgeable people in the region on the topic of e-commerce. I'm joined by Matthew Yarak, who's the uh, Digital Research Director at Shwani Group. Uh, I'm joined by Nagam Akila, who's the Senior E-Commerce Director at OMD. And I'm joined by Shelin Shukla, who's head of logistics at a leading UAE electronics retailer. So what I'm going to do is, we're, just to get, the, uh, to get the conversation started, I'm going to ask you to look at this from a consumer point of view and just briefly tell us what was the last thing, uh, I'm going to ask each of you, what was the last thing that you uh, bought uh, through e-commerce, or the last notable thing you bought, and what your sort of overall experience has been as a consumer during uh, lockdown? Um, and uh, to pick someone at random, I will start with you, uh, Sherlyn. What was your... Yeah, it was uh, pretty bad because, you know, despite everybody having all these stocks, all the people, warehouses working, office working, but the moment there was a lockdown, and if you get a 10-day delivery, you know, timeline for your milk or a 15-day delivery timeline for your, you know, tab, which your kid needs, you know, so it was really a pathetic failure, I would say. That despite you have the everything ready, but your last mile delivery is not ready, you know. So actually, my uh, experience wasn't that bad. Um, I've been a long time e-commerce shopper. I mean, I work in e-commerce. It would be ironic if I wasn't using all of these services, right? Um, but overall, my experience has been pretty okay. 
Uh, I wasn't surprised that delivery timings were delayed. Obviously, there was an influx, but it just changed how I planned my shopping. Um, the last thing I bought was groceries, and honestly, that's really been most of the most of what I've been buying online. But overall, it, it hasn't been bad. There have been pockets of you know interesting initiatives, um, you know, which we'll talk about um, through the webinar. But overall, it's been good. Cool. And I guess from my side, I'll talk about two. One, which is pretty awful, literally awful, to the maximum. And the second was like an amazing journey. So the first one, I'm, I'm a light type of, uh, of e-buyer. E okay, so I'm not the one that goes every time and buys. So it's like, and even when the whole situation starts, it's like, I'm going to be, I'm going to try to be a gamer. I'm not a gamer. So it's like, okay, I'm going to start with the PS4. Okay, so I bought it from, uh, from an e-com platform. Okay. I was like, I'm gonna start that now. And I got delivered after three weeks, like, oh. So it literally killed my ambitions to be a gamer. <laughs> the second, which is like pretty awful, and like all the different like back and forth between us and the, uh, and the platform. The second one, it's literally like, it happened like two days ago. So I bought a TV console. So I'm part of the people who actually went back and started buying furniture for the sake of change. So that one, I literally, I literally bought it. It's just like for the sake of change. It's been at home for almost two months. So I bought it and it's like the guy told me it's going to deliver, be delivered the second day at 10 a.m. Literally the second day at 10 a.m. And I told him I'm going to pay by, by card. So it's like with this machine, it's like it was so simple in a way. It's like, here you go. One day, card machine at 10 a.m. It's not even 10.1, 10 a.m. So this is like these two type of, uh, this is the, the two experiences that I, I had. Like during the situation. Well, you'll have the uh, you'll have the TV console ready to put the PlayStation on it when it finally arrives. Um, yeah, at, at the same time after three weeks. <laughs> and uh, so now, sort of switching to that's interesting. So, so very sort of mixed um, mixed impressions uh, of of what happened, and that's. Um, I wonder whether that was you know partly to do with the load on the on the delivery people or on the on the suppliers and things and I think that's something that we'll we'll start looking at quite soon um, another thing I'll ask you is what uh, what patterns and trends have you noticed uh, during uh, sort of COVID times and I think this is time to sort of put on your um, you know to take off your consumer hats and put on your your marketer hats um, I might start with you Matthew um, as you've uh, I mean, you're a, a data sure. specialist, so you've probably seen an awful lot of data. Um, and yeah. again, when I ask about trends and patterns, there's a million sort of ways to, <laughs> to answer, but sort of what things have surprised you about maybe the way people are shopping or the way people are marketing or the way the, the platforms people sure. are using? What have you noticed? Yeah, so I'm going to start, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a step back and talk about what we have presented last year during one of the campaign breakfast when that, that tackles e-commerce. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so at that, at that time, literally, and then you look, and that's based on the research that we've done internally at Schweide Group. So at that time, the penetration, as estimated by us, does, uh, like was at 47% in Saudi, and then in UE was at 53%. So we ran another piece, literally during the first two weeks of the COVID-19 situation. Okay, so what was interesting is the significant jump in people going online. So we're talking about 47 in Saudi that went to 71 and from 53 in UE that went to 75. So definitely it tells you that people went online. Regardless, you are forced to go online, regardless of the barriers that used to prevent us and so on, because we had to adapt. Okay, it's a new situation that, for, that forced us to, to buy in that manner. But what's more interesting, if you look at, I'm going to say the categories that people are buying now. So in a way, if you look at it, I'm gonna say the whole hierarchy of products literally got changed significantly. So when we used to talk about grocery, it used, we used to talk about it in more of a, of, of, of a category that has some challenges and in literally increasing the penetration of itself and so on. So last year, it was between 6% and 12% between Saudi and UE. Now, 6% now, of um... penetration within from the e-com, from the categories bought online. Now, literally, it sits at around 57 to 56%. So it's a significant surge in terms of how people are buying grocery online. 
But at the same time, th that came in favor of, let's say, a decrease for other categories, which usually used to lead in terms of the categories bought online from apparels, the fashion, electronics, and so on. But definitely things are, are changed on, I'm going to say, probably on weekly basis, where currently after two months of lockdown, because even if you look at it from a, from a human being perspective, when you go into a shock mode and you are faced with something that you have never faced before, you always try to go back to the essentials and try to buy the stuff that makes you survive, right? So it comes the food, the grocery and so on. So now after we realize that, ah, okay, that's the whole situation. We have to adapt to it. So that's when you start going back a bit to normal, not fully, but at least going back to buy the stuff that you used to buy before, given that it should be a little bit essentials. Because if you look at it from a factor perspective, People are a bit uncertain about their financials currently now, about what's happening in the region and so on. So definitely it becomes an essential element of what should I buy as an essential versus the things that I want to buy. Something that it's not a necessity for me. Okay. But at the end, even if you go a bit granular, it differs by generation. So when you talk about the younger generation, Gen Zs and so on, they're more leaned towards the electronic, the gaming and so on. When you talk about the millennials and being like a millennial who's like married, it goes into the grocery, the home appliances, Gen X, the older generation. So the dynamics change by, by generation, I'm gonna say, and by the hierarchy of, uh, of needs and necessities that everyone functions at. I mean, Nagam, you're, you're obviously crunching a lot of data at your end as well. Um, are you, it, what, what it sounds to me that is that, uh, Matthew, is that you're saying that there's strong ups and downs, but it's virtually impossible to, to generalize because you divide people by sector and that's going to change and it'll change from, from day to day, week to week. Um, I mean, are you, are you finding much the same, Nagam? Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's interesting um, what Matthew, you know, what Matthew highlighted and, you know, we're seeing some similar trends. Um, we work with a lot of the, you know, a lot of the key players in the e-commerce space. So, you know, Amazon, Noon, Souk, uh, a lot of the food delivery guys as well. Um, and we also have a lot of clients which are present on those as well as the um, direct, they have their own direct to consumer platforms. Um, overall, we've seen, you know, some of the key players, they've reported 200% increase in terms of traffic. Um, and the industry overall has leapfrogged in the last two months. Um, things, things that we were anticipating that would happen over the next four years have, were already there. So, um, you know, we've, the adoption and, and, uh, and the surge in demand has, has accelerated. And a lot of the um, a lot of the key players are basically playing catch up, especially, you know, when it comes to the last uh, mile. In terms of the consumer behavior, what we saw at the beginning was um, people were starting to stock up on essentials. And that's where we saw spikes in personal hygiene. So, you know, brands like Dettol, Clorox, Lifebuoy, they all won in that space because that's what people were rushing for. Um, but then, um, as well as uh, things like uh, consumer electronics, um, for home office needs. So it was very much about the essentials. But once the first two weeks subsided, what we actually saw was also people shopping for long tail items. So, you know, Matthew, you're the perfect example. You said that you, you know, you shopped for PS4. You know, gaming uh, also increased by around 50%. Um, furniture as well, um, we saw an increase there. Fashion retail um, has seen uh, m maybe not a, as a huge increase um, like grocery. So grocery has grown by about like 88% prior to COVID. Um, however, fashion retail has also grown and we've seen that e-commerce revenue contribution has gone from five to 10%, which has been achieved over the past um, two, three years to 20 to 25% over the last two months. So we can just see the revenue contribution has also shifted um, for categories like uh, fashion retail. The other key trend that we've seen is online food delivery. So around the world, those numbers have gone down. However, we've seen those numbers grow, especially in Saudi, with major players by around 50%. So it depends on, uh, again, uh, the, you know, who who um, you know, is leading in that space uh, and, and reaping that uh, benefit. Obviously markets like Kuwait faced a full uh, lockdown. So um, all of those businesses suffered, but those that, had, um, that allowed things like grocery and food delivery to um, keep going 
um, food delivery did see a spike. What if, um, now one thing there, that you, uh, Shelin, you've, obviously you've got a sort of deep view of, uh, of consumer electronics. Um, and uh, what have you seen in terms of sort of that, that sector? Where have you seen things coming and, and going? And, and what sort of time frame have you seen them, them coming and going? Did you, did you see a, a dip as people started spending on just essentials and then, and then arise as Matthew bought his PlayStation? Or, um, you know, or where did you, you know, what sort of trends have you seen? So before we jump into that, I would like to, you know, congratulate the food deliveries guys, you know. Those were the guys who did not fail us. They continued delivery and I have friends in the food supply chain who said that despite the spike in orders, they were still delivering in one hour or, you know, maybe little more. So no seven day, you know, <laughs> milk delivery or 10 yeah. day bread delivery. So I think that was a clear winner. And the other... Uh, at least the revolution or evolution has been the, you know, rise of uh, the grocery delivery app, you know, in rest of the world, it's so highly evolved, but here probably it was very small. So everybody was, uh, you know, caught uh, unaware and, you know, they had to suddenly gear up and, you know, arrange the delivery. And there were uh, thankfully people delivering. And again, one of the food delivery app uh, was regularly delivering uh, milk and bread and, you know, other similar essentials in less than an hour, which was really amazing against a delivery promise of seven days, 10 days for some others. And of course, the kids were caught at home and their schools were starting. So distance education, they needed uh, tablets, they needed laptops. More than laptops, I think tablets was, were on fire. And uh, I happened to you know visit Carrefour one day and there was a huge uh, demand for laptops and people were buying like crazy because work from home requirement, the offices, I mean, suddenly, I mean, if you have a large number of employees, you cannot give them laptops overnight. So people were buying laptops on their own because, you know, generally, typically home laptops are not so, you know, uh, useful for professional uh, working. And, you know, then you had multiple people at home using your laptops. So there was a huge rush. And also people were stuck at home. So they wanted Netflix. They wanted big TVs. They wanted, you know, to watch football and all those things, they were at stuck at home. So they wanted, wanted good audio. So speakers were doing well. So I think a lot of these categories were on fire, literally. Are you seeing that, are you seeing that moderate now as everybody sort of has their, their home set up, um, you know, that, that, they've, that they've made those, uh, those purchases and now their home setups are sort of where they want them to be? Yes, so it has cooled down a little bit and I have friend in a furniture, uh, you know, company as well. And they had a spike of almost, you know, 100% plus and uh, which, which they were so baffled. They said people have never bought sofas in such a huge number on uh, e-commerce. But luckily also they were geared up and they were delivering in time. So it has cooled down probably once the lockdown opened and the rush at Mall of Emirates, if you see, and you know, Carrefour, there's literally teeming with people. So I think little, little bit cooled down now. What about the platforms that you've seen? Uh... Again, sort of let's stick with um, consumer electronics because obviously there's a there's a number of places that if I want a, a television, I can either buy it from one of the, I can either buy it direct from the supplier. You know, some of them have their own websites, um, I believe. Um, I can buy it from a sort of dedicated uh, bricks and mortar electronics store with a, um, you know, with an omni-channel presence, or I can buy it from one of the big pure players. What sort of what sort of um, splits are you seeing there, and how and you know are you surprised by any of that? Uh, no, we are not surprised. But I think a lot of uh, buying uh, behavior was uh, based not on prices, which is normally the case on e-commerce. You know, because people are always looking for a ten dollar Rolex on these uh, marketplaces, <laughs> so they are looking for cheap deals. So the consumer behavior suddenly shifted. And, uh, you know, people or the companies or the websites who were delivering faster were preferred. And I don't want to take names, but the big ones were overwhelmed. You know, they were probably doing 25,000 deliveries a day and there was not enough capacity in the market uh, of last mile delivery to manage all these. So they were giving like 15 day, 18 day delivery promise. So against that, whoever, whoever was able to deliver even in 
two days, three days, or five days, you know, was was a clear winner. I see. Even uh, if I'm gonna add a, a bit on what you. Know. So even from uh, what we saw, even from a consumer perspective, so at the beginning when the whole situation started, it was um, it was a bit more of like who can deliver fast, and I'm willing to pay for that. But now after things settled down a bit, so people went back to the factors that they used to to buy online. So now comes the price again. So now because you already know, let's say how much time it will take, let's to get it let's say from noon or, or from Amazon or, or depends on the category, now have a clearer idea about the time frame that it's gonna take to actually deliver the product. So now with they started looking at the platform, but the most important one is they went back to the price, the discounts, the free deliveries, charges, and, and so on. And I want to highlight the fact that it, it's all because of people are getting a bit uncertain about the whole financial aspect. Okay, and that's when they turn a bit more into the saving mode element. So they prefer now to have discounts over prices now, currently, compared to, pre, compared to the beginning of the situation. With an element, it's like, give me a better price, I'll buy it from you. I'd like to, by the way, quickly reassure, there's a few people that are asking sort of, where are we going to go um, from here? And I just like to sort of uh, um, tell anybody who's, who's watching and listening that that's one of the things that we're definitely going to be focusing on shortly. We're sort of structuring this around sort of looking at where we are now and what we've learned so far. And then we're going to shortly shift onto um, the new normal. And I think that, um, which will be harking back to things like what Matthew was predicting about people maybe being more cost conscious. Um, I think, uh, yes, Nagam, how are you seeing, um, how are you seeing the sort of, the the marketing around uh these things change are you seeing the uh are you seeing a shift from essentials to cost to luxury to treat yourself to i mean what sort of messaging are you seeing and how are you seeing it uh, evolve um so before getting into that i would say we have to look at it d depending by industry and if we look at just you know, e-commerce as a whole, we can, we can kind of categorize certain verticals under three key areas. One are those that are challenged. So industries like um, automotive, travel, um, hospitality, and then you have those that are pivoting, which is most of re which is the majority of uh, retail. And then you have those that are growing, especially in the, um, the CPG uh, sector. If we look at um, those that are challenged, obviously due to certain restrictions, they're not able to provide services. However, you've seen messaging that is very nostalgic, emotional, and keeping the brand uh, alive. Um, those that are pivoting in terms of uh, retail are um, communicating ways to buy. Um, there's a lot of um, offer-based um, communication as well, those that are online. Um, so those that have um, D2C um, um, platforms, um, even introducing new ways. So there's also been a lot of um, acceleration and innovation in the space, um, like WhatsApp ordering, for example. So communicating that to, to people in terms of more options, um, things like contactless delivery um, are, are, are things that are being communicated. So staying relevant and current while also, you know, um, tapping into uh, the brand communications. And then you have those that are uh, growing, um, which is the, the CPG. And um, in, that, in that sector, it's about um, increasing your visibility across the board in terms of, because there's a lot of competition now. So it's how do you increase your visibility and awareness across to basically uh, you know, meet that demand and ensure that people can find uh, your product amongst um, this, you know, uh, this new demand. And uh, I'd go to um, sort of all of you. Where do you think these are? Do you think that those strategies are working? Um, do you think that they are the best way to, to do things? It certainly makes sense uh, when you spell it out like that. Um, and I mean, has anybody sort of found, because uh, I think one of the things that we were discussing briefly over emails earlier was this sort of the split between sort of top of funnel, bottom of funnel. Is, yeah. there, is there much point, you know, is... I would, I tend to think of e-commerce slightly naively because I'm not, you know, I, I'm not the expert, you guys are. I think, I, I would imagine that e-commerce is quite a tactical space uh, with a lot of, especially you were saying that there's a lot of sort of offers and things on retail. 
Um, but you're saying, but you're also saying that for for both the growing and the more challenged ones, there's a lot of sort of a lot more branding about sort of just awareness and whether that's coming to top of mind or staying top of mind. Is this, yeah? How's that? Yeah. How well is that working? And how well are people doing? So yeah, you're absolutely right. So you know, e-commerce is usually thought of as um, a very performance-heavy, lower funnel activity. And yeah, you know, when we're looking at um, you know those. Uh, you know, retail that's um, promoting their, you know, the latest offers and so on, that's still very much lower uh, funnel. Um, however, we, we have seen clients, you know, uh, maintain a focus on branding in situations where um, they don't have much control over, you know, what they can, what they can do. Um, obviously, keeping in mind availability um, and the overall uh, user experience. However, um, we see we, we're seeing, and what we're we're also trying to do is, you know, educating clients in terms of thinking long term. So there's been an acceleration in e-commerce. A lot of brands are going on there, trying to get their um, e-commerce um, strategy or or have some sort of e-commerce presence to, um, you know, to jump on the bandwagon. However, um, it's time to think, you know, beyond the tactics of, okay, you know, we need to drive the the next sale but also look at that top of mind awareness and um, upper funnel activities. E-commerce needs to be looked at um, in that way as well, just like you would in a, in a typical um, retail environment. If we think about you know, advertising on TV and so on, um, a lot of the brands advertise um, online and, and, and on TV and they have these brand awareness campaigns um, in the hopes that people will go and start you know, buying their, their products. The same, you know, line of thinking needs to apply to e-commerce as well and that's something that we have been doing with a lot of our clients in terms of in terms of planning that and and creating that top of mind awareness um, amazon themselves as well have positioned their platform as a, a brand awareness platform and it's not just for those that sell on amazon you know um, non-endemic clients um, those who you know that's what they they term them those who don't sell on amazon what do you call um, non non-endemic okay yeah so those who who sell on amazon are endemic those who don't right. are non-endemic so non-endemic clients so for example banks um you know um in the past airlines um other other brands that don't necessarily have a presence but might have something that is relevant to um those on those uh, to people on those platforms you know can advertise on amazon to generate that awareness because they're in the they're in that buying mode um, so you have to think about the full funnel when it comes to e-commerce and not just focus on the lower end because you also need to capture that wider customer base when we're thinking about the surge of new uh, you know new uh, new users on these platforms you know to matthew's point there's there was a surge in online traffic and uh, that's absolutely right because you have a lot of people that are new to these platforms that are exploring. And so it's an opportunity to actually widen the funnel, capture that new customer base to eventually convert them, you know, through throughout the funnel. Yeah, and even if, if I can uh, add on what Maram is saying, so even we're actually seeing it within, within our group. So we have tons and lots of econ players going TV nowadays. In order for them to actually create that top of mind level, the awareness level to increase the user base and then funnel it down. But the most important thing, I guess, even if I'm going to add on top of it, it plays a dual role at the same time. And that way it gives you that user base, that, that reach, if I'm going to say it like from a media, media metrics perspective, but at the same time, it can play a performance role. TV Sorry? can play a performance role. Yes, definitely. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll tap into it. And, uh, and even I'll, I'll tap into a case study that, that, that was done recently in one, yeah, in one of the biggest clients in Saudi Arabia and in partnership with Hearts and Science, which is part of, of IMG Group. Yeah. So, uh, so TV can play a dual role from that angle. So in, in a way of increasing, increasing the, the footprint of, uh, to, to, to everyone to, to, and that creating an awareness. But at the same time, using it in the right manner can actually drive performance. 
And, I'm, and I mean by that, even through the solution that you even Austin mentioned at the beginning, through brand forms, for instance, okay? So in a way, it actually, it helps you like funnel it down and have it like in the right manner, the right time, the right moment, the right creative, the right messaging to actually drive that performance, which is like the lower funnel means increase in terms of our traffic, increase in terms of orders, in terms of the phone call deliveries and, and so on. And, uh, and uh, that's an amazing case where we actually work with uh, KFC and Heart and Science on, uh, on a campaign in Saudi Arabia. So, uh, and, and the beauty of it, it, it brought us the three different elements together. It's the media, it's the media player, the, the agency, and then the brand itself. So the, 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 the beauty of it, it's used and they're creative what it actually meant for Saudi's consumers. Because even if you start with that basic element, it's like what's gonna matter for you when it comes to food delivery, safety, hygiene, right? So using that, it's, you can actually get it like contactless in a way if you order, but at the same time, making sure that you deliver it at the right time and the right moment during the day with the right mix, with the right optimization. And I mean right optimization because we need to think about it from a data optimization perspective. It actually delivered increase in web traffic and increase in terms of orders. And that's attributed to, to a media that usually used to be positioned as, as, a, as an awareness or a medium which actually plays a key and functional role when it comes to performance. You, you touched here actually on, on data. And I think that's a very important thing to move on to. And, uh, and I might move on to um, uh, uh, Shalin to sort of, talk about sort of some on the ground, uh, you know, sort of on the ground experience. Do you feel that you're getting enough data and how are you managing to work with that data from a sort of marketing perspective? How, you know, where are you getting data on your, on your consumers? Um, how are you able to sort of leverage that? Uh, where's the sort of, you know, where's the data strong? Where's the data weak? What do you, what do you, what are your wish lists for, you know, for knowing more about your customers? I think on an overall basis, there was a lot of data available, but, you know, not enough analysis being done by all the, you know, uh, gurus uh, of the, you know, market. I hear that a lot, yes. Data. Lots of data, not enough analysis. Yes. Yeah, not enough analysis. And uh, almost everything went wrong. And uh, probably we'll see the rise of, you know, grocery delivery, you know, coming of age. And, and uh, you know, one thing we've noticed that, you know, nothing can beat the need-based advertising, you know, and as uh, Matthew said, you know, that grocery guys were advertising that, you know, contactless delivery, safety, hygiene, and all those things, you know, those mattered, you know. Otherwise, you know, no amount of advertising could have sold clothes and cosmetics, you know, in these times. So probably, you know, we all need to reinvent ourselves into what is going to sell in future and how. Nagam, I know that you've got strong, <laughs> yeah, there you are piping up. I know that you've got strong views on data. Go on, lay into it. Yeah, so, I mean, from a brand perspective, obviously data is important. Having the right infrastructure and tech stack, um, as well as the people to interpret it, will enable brands to plan that better um, across and not just limit it to grocery. I mean, I understand that, yes, there is a, a current need basis now. And I believe that, you know, um, you know, people have kind of come to terms with it, but, you know, people will still want things, you know, down the line. And how do we, how do we move forward from, from, you know, the COVID situation uh, long-term? So even categories like auto, like, um, you know, like fashion, retail, beauty, you know, and whatnot, um, having that data is is important. Having that right, in, really, that the infrastructure is so important. Um, a, a lot of a lot do of um, do we have that? Do we have that infrastructure and that data? It, it, the marketing technologies are available, right? Um, so it's it, it is available. It's a matter of just making making that investment. Um, a, a lot a lot might see it as um, expensive, but I believe that um, you know uh, that you need to look at it long term. So this is a long-term investment in the future of your business um, to enable you to plan better and to, you know, be more agile. Um, agility, I think, is um, what would what is the driving force behind the winners and losers of this, um, you know, of this pandemic. Uh, ultimately, you know, the, the food delivery apps. Why did they win? Because they have a wealth of data, they have the infrastructure, and they were able to utilize it to tap into new pockets. They were able to mobilize their um, you know, their teams, um, you know, to, to service 
uh, consumers in new ways and, and so on and, and maintain their delivery timelines. However, um, you know, from a brand standpoint as well is, is kind of also understanding, okay, what are my hero products? What are, you know, what are the things that, that, that people care about the most as well? So looking at not just first party data, but also uh, looking at the, the third party and, you know, your overall trends and then um, how, do, how does that become part of your organizational structure? We talk a lot about digital transformation. I'm sure everyone's heard of it you know, heard it flying around that, oh, COVID has, you know, digitally transformed our business. Has it though? You know, just because you're online and just because you have a website, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you have the back end in place to capture the right data and, and also using that to go back and funnel that into your marketing to enhance your targeting, to enhance your messaging and all those elements. This seems slightly pessimistic then for the smaller players. There have been a lot of people who have emerged during this, during this crisis as sort of new players in the e-commerce uh, scene, whether, whether through um, judicious planning or because they've had to pivot really quickly. Uh, for example, my favorite coffee shop, I now order coffee grounds online. It's a hastily put together website, it's uh, quite quick. But you're saying that it's a big investment for um, you know, that the, a lot of the data stuff is a big investment. And it seems to me that that could be prohibitive for the, for the smaller players who are, who are just struggling to get stay afloat. Uh, not necessarily. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, kind, the brands that I'm talking about are those that are looking at large volumes, you know, they're looking at, you know, huge, you know, million dollars, millions of dollars of um, revenue targets, you know, and to achieve that kind of incrementality over the long run and to scale, you know, your business effectively, you need to invest in that. However, with the smaller players, um, there's obviously an opportunity there. And, um, you know, again, it's about, it's about the right setup and also understanding the circumstances. So, you know, um, one of the main things that happened in, uh, in, in the UAE was, um, and, and you, you know, this was a story was the food delivery apps were charging high commissions um, to the restaurants and they were struggling to, you know, to survive amid the lockdowns because they're reliant on these food delivery apps. So, you know, a bunch of them got together and they were like, you know what, we're going to go our own way and, and go D to C. Great. However, if you go down that route, and I totally respect that and the need for, for D to C, I do not believe that you should, that any company or brand should put all their eggs in one basket. You know, you should have, um, you know, visibility or, or presence across because you, you should give people options. However, if, if, if those restaurants expect to go D to C and see the same level of sales, it's, it, you know, it, it might, might happen just as an initial spike because people are intrigued, but then you have to invest in driving that traffic which the food delivery apps were providing for them. So, you know, it's about that investment. And then it's like, okay, what are, you know, then looking at, you know, the most popular orders, looking at the different behaviors, the times of day, and, and just, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be a complicated and expensive process for smaller players because there are solutions that are catered to uh, SMEs and there are um, solutions that are catered to larger enterprises. Um, but the bottom, but the concept remains the same in terms of, you know, looking at <clears throat> what's working and then moving fast. I would say even SMEs have a better advantage because they don't have to steer this huge ship with all of these different stakeholders and they're able to make um, decisions on the fly. Um, you know, um, companies like Katopi, for example, you know, they're... Uh, what does do? So they're a cloud kitchen and they service like hundreds of, of restaurants. Um, and they launched Shop Kitopi. They launched meal kits. So they looked at what you know what's happening in the market, and they they responded quickly. They looked at their data and they responded quickly. And they launched these two new product innovations into the market. And you know they're doing quite well. So it, it I don't think size has a role to play. I, I, the solutions are out there, big or small. I think it's just about looking, you know, analyzing that data. You know to um, uh, to Shailen's uh, to, to Shailen's point, uh, you need you need the analysts. You need people to actually look at it, not just gather all this data and house it somewhere. But also having that right infrastructure, and a lot of it can be automated, right? Um, in terms of the interpretation and the visualization to enable 
um, brands to make those uh, decisions fast. Now, I'm going to give you guys a, a quick heads up, by the way. I'm going to move on in a minute to sort of uh, to start looking much more forward looking. I'm also going to give you a heads up because a lot of people have been asking about um, sticking sort of to data about where about the sources of a lot of the the data and the stats that we've been uh, mentioning today so i might ask you towards the end of this to just sort of give me a couple of good sources for for um information on on habits and so on that people can can look into so i'll just sort of leave that sitting at the at the back of your mind before we move on to um what i think is uh well I'm not officially going to questions yet, but I think that uh, Mita summed it up in a in a really in the first question that we got through, which is what will the new normal be for the for the e-commerce space? At the moment, again, we're talking about a lot of people sort of struggling to survive, but um, I think that it's also a case of looking at you know how is this um, how is this going to change? I was reading a report recently that said that the the market is a lot more forgiving to smaller players now now that they are struggling to survive but things like uh customer service things like uh, uh shellen's pet peeve of uh well and matthews of uh of delivery times will become much more important in customer service and things so what are the sort of you know what are the major changes that we're going to see in e-commerce uh in the coming years months and years as as we sort of come out of lockdown if you could gaze into your crystal balls i think um, nagma touched on a very very important point uh, which uh, i would like to elaborate on which is automation you know so people are spending millions of dollars into product development category management website it big data as well as you know market research but the total focus is lost on the back end you know do you have automation in the back end you know you are getting 25000 orders a day but is your uh, warehouse automated enough to you know geared up to pick up those kind of deliveries is your have you invested enough in last mile delivery uh, you know yourself or through your associates so that you know that extra capacity is available on the tap nobody has done that to all the ceos who have always been asking for an roi for a you know robotics or automation of warehouses this is the answer this pandemic is the answer it was a difference between life and death exist or don't exist it was not about roi warehouse automation is not about roi you know delivery having a delivery software so that the customer knows you know when the delivery is exactly going to come is not a question of roi it's an essential you have to have so you need so much of automation and that investment has just not taken place you know so i think sooner or later people will wake up and the winners will be you know like in uk you see lot of warehouses have so much of automation you know ocado is one of the biggest examples that despite people not coming the picking rate did not stop why because they had you know so many robots doing the picking you know ocado is a very famous example worldwide which one sorry what what's it called card ocado ocado oh thank you yeah and uh, you know in a situation like this when people are just not available it it doesn't matter your roi doesn't matter it's it's a question of your survival it's a question of your existence so i think that automation has to happen people have to deliver into again we're talking i mean this yes this will be an interesting one looking longer term because we're looking i mean robots don't come cheap um <laughs> there uh... as i said it's not a question of roi it's a question of you being there or not being there and it seems that also that that uh it's sort of the automation and the communication between the different uh between the different stages that um if you're if you don't have that robot um and it can't keep up to be able to transmit that through the whole sort of system so that you're you're not putting out ads for products that have so that sold out last week and that you're not promising next day delivery when you're um when actually your delivery backlog is there and it seems to me that this is one of the sort of big problems is the sort of is the the automation or the sort of the systems talking to each other um so i suspect there's going to be a lot of investment there i don't know whether we're sort of seeing that yet and sort of and it's, and it's very basic it's very basic you need to have a ai driven demand planning system which tells you what is going to run out tomorrow what are what is going to be out of stock in a week and in a month 
so that your buyers can plan plan and replenish nakam how uh, oh matthew <laughs> um sort of coming back to you to sort of look at that from a sort of marketing and messaging point of view how how much do you actually see these uh these sort of systems integrating with the with the marketing teams and with um you know we can do amazing automated marketing programmatic advertising can retarget people it can hit them with exactly the right ad for the right thing at the right time how well is that tied in with actually but if they then click and it says out of stock all that's gone to gone to waste how well are these things tied in um from what i see uh i mean there's already um you know solutions that are cropping up that allow you to shop in banner for example and those can be served uh, programmatically they're integrated so solutions like um you know Adamo um are already available in the market so i think we're going to see more of those kinds of offerings um that allow people to shop directly from you know through that through the ad and add um add the products to their basket um so then you know when it comes to um you know campaigns that are running you know off site you know off the e-commerce platforms um that that will be um you know a really good link also things like you know facebook um collaborative ads instagram shopping you know these are all um available um as well and i think we're going to see uh, more solutions like that um the other the other thing that i see long term is um investment in the user experience so especially when it comes to d to c um how do you you know investment in seo um improving the ui um things like you know um heat maps recommendation engines and so on um and just overall you know enhancing the the overall presence um from a from a data perspective i would expect um you know for the grocery category in specific because it's still very nascent so you know the players have been playing catch up um i see the the level of uh data in the long run reaching the level of current retail data that you get um in terms of their retail audits and so on but um reaching that you know on e-commerce as it increasingly becomes uh more important Matthew, what yes, if I, uh, yeah if yeah if i'm going to add on uh, on top of it so even if you if you think because definitely that period of time actually more about the dynamics what should be fixed what's what's working what's not working from an e-commerce perspective and even most importantly from a consumer behavior perspective because at the end it will dictate everything the way that you know that you're going to approach them so i guess even even if you're going to look at probably what's going to come next okay and that's what you call the what if scenario if let's say the whole lockdown was removed and then like people are allowed to go back to their normal life so even once we understand if people are willing to go back even though even if it's gradually to start like shopping the traditional way of actually doing their shopping it means become a heavy burden on the e-com platform to actually retain these people because even now if if i'm a, if let's say i'm a grocery buyer online grocery buyer but i guess when things are lifted up i might go back to the tradition of buying my grocery because i enjoy let's say pushing the the, the shario and then buying the stuff you know what i mean so once you understand probably this uh, this dynamics it becomes a matter of how you need to retain to retain a certain customer probably not even to buy all the products the way that you used to buy but at least have a certain basket value that's that's uh, that can generate like a good roi i'm i'm going to say um to add to matthew's point um this is where really the whole omni channel experience Uh, I think in the long term we're really going to see it, see it play out. So you know we've been talking omnichannel in the um, in the industry for a while. Um, very few have successfully done it, but I think this is where you know it's really going to um, you know it's going to materialize. And right now, but you know at the pace that we've grown, um, we've in my opinion we've caught up to the you know to the more developed markets and so we're going to start seeing you know things that are so things that are happening uh, there happen here as well in the long term so we're going to be on par with global trends moving forward i yeah, think the ui where, has to be good enough to keep the customers with you you know because the grocery customers will immediately go back if you don't have a pleasant user experience and matthew touched uh, upon this point it's very important you know some of the biggest grocery players have horrible horrible apps <laughs> i am um, yeah i think that i mean my my personal experience has been has been much the same that uh, you know that 
there's you come for necessity, you stay for user experience. Um, but also, uh, what Matthew said is that there could well be this this bounce back. You know, we will aren't we all pining for those those glory days of choosing our pasta from a from a you know a supermarket shelf of uh, you know of trying to fit all our toilet roll into a bag and carry it home. The uh, I miss those days. There's going to be this this bounce back, and then and then maybe we'll start to do a bit more shopping again. Um, now we're going to, have to start to wrap up, but I've got an awful lot of questions here, um, and I'm going to uh, try and sort of uh, pick some of them. Um, oh, here's an interesting one from Rowan. Um, Rowan, uh, most of the brands in Saudi were ready, were not ready to start selling online. Um, however, with the current situation, most of them had to act fast, and most of them uh, buying ready e-commerce websites or apps. Uh, so do you think these brands will not be doing well because they don't have a full strategy or is it a good decision or are they, is it a good decision? Basically, can you, what if you've had to leap in feet first by buying a ready-made off-the-shelf e-commerce solution, can you then leverage that going forwards or are you just going to have to put it back on the shelf once this is over? You can definitely... You can definitely leverage it. However, you know, with with any so with any D2C offering, there's also an investment into the marketing to direct traffic um, and then retain the users. And again, you know, um, having all the right, you know, measurement and tracking in place to enable that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, I mean, it's definitely doable. Again, if it's just um, something that they're doing, you know, short term and they're putting it up to check off a box, it's not going to work. Um, if they used it as, a, as an opportunity to really um, change the way they do business um, and, and also drive their marketing and maintain their marketing spends. So we've seen a lot of, you know, a lot of D2C have actually increased their marketing spends. Um, to and and have seen you know great performance come off of that. Um, but if you are cutting budgets and just putting the, that money towards a site and just putting it up and expecting people to you know show up and buy, it's not going to work. Uh, that actually ties in with a couple more questions that I've got from both Sate DG and Sarah, who say who are talking about Shopify. Now I don't know Shopify, but I, I get the impression that it's a software as a service, a ready-made platform. Yeah. Um, and so do you think we're going to see more competition coming in, coming in there? Um, and also, how are those sort of moving out of COVID, how are those players going to differentiate themselves? Uh, yeah. The sort of carries on from what you were saying, that uh, it's one thing that if they're doing, if they're just there because they should be there, they're not going to survive. But how do they make sure that they, that they aren't just doing it for the sake of appearances? Yeah, so I, I mean, it ultimately um, it ultimately depends on the on the business strategy and the level of commitment of the of those brands to their um, to e-commerce. Um, you know, as stores open up, there is uh, you know a, a concern that um, some of these um, companies might just abandon or just scale back and go back to their old ways of doing things. Um, e-commerce is here to stay; it's not a fad. Um, it's it's only going to grow. Um, even you know, even if things stabilize, the baselines you know for now versus pre-COVID are still going to be higher, and we're going to see that continued growth. So, um, you know, Shopify is a great solution. It is a plug and play, so it's something that's really easy to implement. Um, but again, you know, when it comes to your e-commerce presence, the, the user experience, the product availability, and that top of mind awareness are very important. Um, as well as, um, you know, my advice would be, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket because D2C should be a long-term. If you're setting up, a, you know, a Shopify or using something like Magento or, or any of these solutions, it should be part of a long-term strategy for you to sell online. Um, a lot of a lot of um, clients that we work with um, have a, a multi a multi channel strategy. So some have D two C. Um, however, they are also present on marketplaces. They're also present in other um, channels where they are where they can sell, and it makes sense for them to to, to sell. Um, because 
if one goes down, you still have something that is up and uh, up and running. And you also have different pockets of uh, of customers, right? So people who are on marketplaces have a certain mindset and are looking for certain things. And it, it also allows you to tap into cross category um, uh, user bases. So someone who might not be looking, for example, for a watch, they might be in market for something, you know, you can target them, you know, with your watch and get them to buy it there. Um, Whereas if you're looking at purely D2C, you have a set audience in mind. And again, this is where the data comes into play. I'm not going to repeat myself there. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a different audience there. Maybe the, those are the people who have like a certain brand affinity and you're building that brand affinity to, to drive them there. Um, and again, like, you know, other channels, depending on the industry that you're in, um, you know, have a role to play as well. So not all eggs in one basket. And um, D2C is great as long as it's a long-term strategy. Now, I've got, I've only got time for, in fact, I don't think I even have time for that, but I'm in charge, so I'm gonna make time for one more question, which comes from, before we wrap up, which comes from uh, Yves Michel Gabe. And uh, that's, uh, he's written, according to Content Square, which is surveying 900 platforms across 26 different countries, we've now achieved a plateau, but the growth of e-commerce um, of 29% before the COVID crisis, What's your prediction for the region? Now, I might direct this one to, to Matthew. Basically, what are your sort of numerical predictions for the growth of, uh, of e-commerce? Do you, do you have any visibility on that? Um, uh, have you revised yeah. your, your numbers? Okay, I, I guess from what we've seen and how we were pushed to actually go online and buy stuff, where it actually increased the whole penetration of e com and, and talk about Saudi and the E to reach, let's say, these levels of uh, 70s in terms of e com penetration, definitely it's going to increase. And most importantly, it's going to increase on the category level. Okay, so even if you go on a subcategory level, where that's where we're going to see the significant, I'm going to say the, the surge, the significant surge in terms of, of the product sets you're going to buy. Hopefully, and I'm going to say it all goes back to what's going to come next, what's going to happen, how we will behave in terms of how would you retain like certain categories to be leading in terms of e penetration. But I guess like once we go back a bit into, into the norms, I'm going to say uh, step by step that we're going to see like the surge again in categories that they used to actually sit on top of the ladder from, from, a, from a penetration perspective. But I guess like we were pushed there. Now we overcome all the barriers that we used to have when it comes to econ. And I guess like we're now more, more uh, I'm going to say, more flexible in the way that we're gonna deal with uh, with e-com brands and the way that we're gonna buy some uh, e-com e e e products, and that's I, I guess it's gonna it's gonna go across even uh, the whole board. Um, well, I think uh, I'm getting strong messages to uh, to, to wrap up. Um, I'm going to uh, so as I say, I say, I did say that I'd come back to data. So, is there any sort of um, do you have any sort of really good preferred sources of, of data um, that are good to, uh, to go to for, for finding out sort of um, where we are now and predictions and so on? I mean, whether it's your own sources, whether it's your own, uh, whether it's your own research, um, whether it's, uh, <laughs> I've, uh, I've got, Yves Michel's uh, ragging you here. He's saying that, <laughs> <laughs> He's saying he wants numbers right now. Um, no, where would you, where would you go yeah, for those but numbers? That's, that's, that's what I am saying. It's like from us, we don't have literally a number that's going to come on the econ. We're saying it's significantly increased, but what we're forecasting is an increase on the category level. Right. Okay. And that's what I have mentioned because even now, what we're seeing uh, from, uh, let's say, an apparel or fashion perspective, it's forecasted to increase 10% post COVID 19 if things go back to normal. So, when it comes to e com in general, I guess it's a very broad question. So, definitely, it's, 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 it becomes difficult to actually forecast where it's going to be on an overall industry level. From a category perspective, I'm going to say it's, it's, uh, it's easily predictable of how people, if they're going to go back a little bit to normal and buy the stuff that they used to buy before. <laughs> so, Ava Michelle, I don't have the plus 29% or plus 30%. <laughs> so, and where would you, where, where's a good place to look for data? Where do you, where do you gather your data from? Are there any sort of really good sources that um, people looking further into this should be, should be looking up? 
So from our side, literally everything I mentioned, it's based on uh, our own internal research because we have, the, we have a, big a big footprint from digital perspective in Saudi and UAE. Uh, so it gives us that clear indication on the online population and how it's going because when you talk e-com, you talk online population. But even at the same time, we also have our own behavioral data, which also at the same time can add another, an additional layer to better understand the dynamics from, uh, from a behavioral perspective and, and where it's heading. So basically, whatever I've mentioned, it's, uh, it's based our, on our own internal data. And I'd like to uh, just put a, a, well, in fact, a sort of a mutual plug in here that um, uh, you guys uh, over at uh, DMS and Schwery have been providing some really handy uh, infographics on e-commerce and all sorts of things from, you know, sort of different forms of consumption, whether it's of, uh, of media or, um, uh, or actual goods and services and so on over on campaignme.com. So uh, there's, a, there's a link there to a lot of the research that you've actually been, been mentioning um, on some quite handy infographic forms. Um, Shelen, when you're looking for sort of insights and data, where do you, where do you go? I think it's uh, mostly internal and, you know, we, yep. we, do, we do by, we do by uh, you know, sort of uh, research data from outside, but uh, I cannot really comment on that. Oh, no, 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 of course. Not my domain, yeah, not my domain. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, Nagam, you are the, the queen of data here. What's your, <laughs> what's your go, -to, go to sources on, on data? Is it all internal or is it external or what's your... Um, so, uh, you know, uh, we look at, um, you know, on a client basis, we look at the brand data. So first party where available. Um, and then um, we also, we also have a lot of, you know, great relationships in the, in the industry with key players. So, you know, a lot of the behavioral insights and, and what's happening in the region, um, you know, uh, we, we talk to them um, to understand and, you know, how that will impact our strategies for our clients. Um, also, you know, partners like DMS and um, other studies, you know, um, that have been conducted, we tap into those. So we also have like a full analytics team that, you know, goes through all of that and, um, you know, deciphers it, um, you know, and distills it um, with key action uh, action points for, for the agency. So... Do you do you find there's challenges getting the data from, you know, because one of the one of the criticisms that uh, one of the problems that I hear, and somebody's actually just raised it, Gagan's actually just raised it in the discussion things. So we can tie it. It's not another question. We've run out of questions, but it certainly ties into this: is the the challenges of getting data from the walled gardens of of platforms, um, yeah. whether that's and presumably does does Am do the likes of Amazon and Noon do they count as walled gardens now? Are they? Yeah, they do. They're. Yeah. Yeah, so they are walled gardens. Um, obviously, a lot of a lot of them safeguard their data. It's their, um, you know, it's what makes them uh, different and, and stand out. We do have indicators, though, um, you know, through you know through their um, through our partnerships. Obviously, anything that I know can't say because I'm under NDAs. Um, <laughs> but you know, there are, there are a lot of um, safeguards. But you know, on a brand level. You know, if you're running if you're running campaigns on Amazon, you do get that brand level data. You do get that granularity in terms of who was who, you know, which audiences bought um, bought your product. Who was also in market? What are the optimizations that we created? What are the the products that sold better? And all of that, you know, it, it is available. Um, but if we're talking about overall um, uh, trends, yeah, I mean, you know, we do have that. We do that have that knowledge, and they do share those top line. Um, insights with us. So um, it helps us, you know, put strategies forward and, and plan for our clients. Well, we've got to wrap it up now. So I'm going to ask you one final question each, which is I want you to give just one piece of advice to um, for a marketer struggling with e-commerce today. Um, you know, where, so uh, Shellen, where what would your uh, piece of advice be? I think from our supply chain point of view, there'll be, you know, big rise in dark stores and cloud kitchens and, you know, things which are unseen and not really present here. But uh, these these people will do very well because uh, all the data is pointing that, you know, you need to be ready for e-commerce. And this is, this is the way that you can create. And dark stores are really like 
any other supermarket but they don't sell they, they don't allow customers at best you could do a you know a click and collect but uh, mostly it's meant for uh, last mile delivery collection so i think those kind of things we will see and lot of marketing will be around that and somebody mentioned kitopi i think so google cloud kitchens in india are uh, you know very doing very well now so these things should do well uh, basis whatever data is coming matthew what uh, what advice would you have for um for the for the the e-commerce marketer right there i guess i'll focus a bit more on the data okay and because even when when you talk about data it, it can go as granular as you want when you dissect the different type of data but i guess it's all it's also important to 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 look at it because it tells you what's how you need to talk to your to your to your customer to your to your brand or to the consumers when where the what and so on because that becomes more of an effective type of communication so everything that's data informed in terms of strategies will bring i guess it's alright and we've seen it through different cases and Nagam, what's uh, save, um, save, save the industry? My, <laughs> my advice would be look at your channel strategy um, and uh, make sure that your investments are in line with um, you know, the key players that are going to drive your, your business forward. So um, you know, don't necessarily put all your eggs in one basket with one, or, one approach or the other. Um, it's okay to test. You know, testing is actually a great way to to figure out what works for you in the long in the long term, and um, optimize your um, your channel strategy as well as your uh, marketing investments to match that. So um, look at understand the dynamics of of the channels that you're on. So, for example, if you're on, you know, a car four, um, it, you know, the, the majority of their traffic is um, web based, not app based. So your marketing investments should reflect that to make sure that you're present on the web where people are. Whereas if you're on Amazon and you're advertising on Amazon, um, the bulk of their traffic is mobile app based. So you need to shift your, so it's about matching the investments to the dynamics of each channel, as well as across the priority channels where you're operating in to help you get the most out of the, the current situation. And then be agile and invest in, in the future of e-commerce for your business. Cool. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Um, I was just trying to, I was quickly trying to put together three Ds that have come out of this, because I think that we've been looking at um, data is obviously crucial. Um, diversification, not like you were just saying, not putting all your eggs in one basket. And to be honest, I couldn't come up with a third D, so I just put down customer experience, I think, is, uh, delivery, is the other delivery. thing. Sorry? Delivery, last line delivery. delivery. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, there we go. I'm so obvious. Okay. Diversification, data, and delivery. That's my, um, <laughs> so that's uh, three points that have come out of this uh, from a, although I'd encourage you all to go back and uh, watch the video of this whole thing again, because there's an awful lot more points in there, including some, some really good uh, data as well. Um, thanks again to all our panelists. Thank you, uh, Matthew Yarak, the Digital Research Director at Shwari Group. Uh, thank you, Nagam. Keela, who's Senior E-Commerce Director at OMD. And thank you, Shailen Shukla, uh, Head of Logistics uh, at a major uh, UAE electronics retailer. Um, I'd also like to thank, uh, I'm going to leave you guys sitting there until we sort of sign off, because I'm going to say thank you again to our sponsor, um, Brandformance, which is, the, Matthew touched on it, the revolutionary TV attribution solution, which measures the impact of TV on brands e-commerce. Um, proof that, uh, it's not just uh, a bottom of the funnel, e-commerce is not just bottom of the funnel strategy and uh, that works all through the thing. And DMS, uh, which is the lead region's leading digital partners for independent publishers, official arm Schwerly Group. Um, and do, as I say, pop over to Campaign Middle East to check out uh, some of their research. Um, thanks a lot to, uh, actually, thanks a lot to the Motivate team, to uh, Anusha, Nadim, Feroz, read various other people who've worked on our first webinar. We've all managed to stay on without, uh, there was a danger that I'd be turning into a potato or something, but uh, we seem to have managed to avoid that. Um, and so thanks to everybody behind the scenes. Uh, we'll be sharing a video of this conversation um, on our social channels. So keep watching our social channels regardless. Um, keep visiting the website, keep reading the magazine. I don't know whether any of you saw on the chat that uh, 
Ian, our, uh, uh, the, the head of uh, Motivate Media Group, was encouraging everybody to uh, get in touch and uh, get campaign home delivery is now available. So um, you can still have a wonderful, remember this, a proper paper magazine delivered to your door. So do drop us a line. Um, and uh, next issue is out on May 31st. So either get it delivered to your door or um, read it on issue. Get in touch with us if you want to get involved with any more webinars um, and keep sending us your feedback as this is our first webinar. I thought it went wonderfully. Um, we, we always want to do better. Um, and uh, yeah, keep an eye out for further webinars. I can't believe how many people came. So thank you all for attending. And once again, just thank you, uh, Shelin, Matthew and Nagam. I think that, uh, I hope that together we've just made Next time your e-commerce delivery comes on time, next time the marketing hits you correctly, next time uh, you see the appropriate ad in the appropriate place, that's, I like to think we've had a little bit to do with that. So um, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, keep in touch. Thanks, Austin. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.